Uh, welcome everybody and um, welcome to this early market engagement for the first major procurement exercise that's going to be undertaken by the Sustainable Manufacturing and Environmental Pollution Programme. We expect this to last about 25 minutes for presentations and then up to another uh, 35 minutes for question and answers and a roundup and next steps. So as you can see from the agenda, we have a brief introduction right now, which is ongoing. We will then, Amanda is then going to talk about the um, plastics procurement opportunity, which, um, and, and this particular um, opportunity of the program. Um, and then we're going to have a, a bit more of a technical com uh, conversation about the submission requirements. Um, our, our plastics expert, Terry McCormick, will lead that. And then also the particular requirements from our funder, FCDO, the UK government's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, which will be um, led by Carl Veselink, our team leader. Then we'll have the questions and then we'll have a final roundup. So um, today, um, uh, we have on the panel, we have myself, um, I'm the project director of the, of the program. We have Ken D'Souza who represents um, the FCDO today. Um, we have Amanda who is leading on the technical management of the, of the, of the program management office. Uh, we have Carl who I've already mentioned is our team leader. And we have Terry, who I've also already mentioned, who's our technical expert. Just a very brief sort of background to SMEP. SMEP is a um, sustainable manufacturing environmental pollution program. It is a research program. It comes out of DFID's, or sorry, FCDO's research and evidence uh, division. Um, it's particularly focused on um, the pollution that comes from manufacturing in developing countries. Um, so some parts of this pollution, because particularly there's a, a plastics core, which is the focus of today, um, this is a global problem. It has a particular problem with oceans. So although our focus are, are uh, developing countries and the FCDO does also have priority countries, we are looking for solutions that will help developing countries. So um, cooperation with those countries, but it doesn't need to be solely uh, from those countries is what we're particularly interested in. So the program itself is looking at um, pollution from manufacturing, be it from pollution to air or water. Um, um, and then, uh, so that's a major part, the major part of the program, but we also have a component on plastics, which is the focus of today's call. We also have another component um, on um, circular economy and um, um, the uh, um, sustainable consumption production part of manufacturing. And we also have a specific part for research and evidence, you know, pay, uh, production of papers, et cetera. The long-term view of what we're trying to achieve here is that we're looking for new technologies, new approaches. We're particularly interested in, in intervening within the manufacturing process. Our primary focus is not the waste stream although because of reprocessing uh, is obviously part of manufacturing and um, um, uh, being part, um, intervening in that area is, is of interest, but we're primarily interested in the, in, the, uh, in the manufacturing process and improving that and new technologies, new interesting approaches to reducing pollution to air and water from critical manufacturing processes. We have already uh, a research report, I think it's on our website, looking at some of the priority uh, manufacturing pollution problems globally and in some of our core countries, which I encourage you to have a look at. Um, today's, um, obviously the procurement that we're, we're launching today is around plastics. So we're particularly interested in, in new technologies that help uh, in plastic substitution. Um, and uh, my colleague, uh, Terry will be uh, providing much more detail on on on, the, on that sort of um, uh, on on what on our requirements. So I think without much further ado, I'll hand over to Amanda to um, to give us uh, an overview of of this particular um, uh, procurement opportunity. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jeremy. I'm going to talk just very broadly about the intention of the procurement. Terry will get more into the details. So um, we're investing in, in initiatives, primarily upstream initiatives, which have the potential to reduce um, negative impacts of, of plastics pollution. Um, obviously the plastics pollution in the, um, in the marine environment is a, is a, is a key, key concern for the SMEP program. 
um, noting that 80% of marine debris is, is actually plastics um, and that we have 8 million tons um, of new plastics going into the oceans annually, contributing to what's estimated to be 150 million tons in the ocean. So very broadly speaking, um, our, our vision is to, is to enable effective solutions um, and to do this through identifying um, fundable innovative um, concepts, interventions essentially um, upstream. So the intention of SMEP is to, is to well, we take cognizance of the fact that there are a lot of um, global initiatives that are running currently. Um, largely as a response to the overwhelming um, plastic concern. And that we, we aim to, to really complement those funds by focusing on the technical solutions um, within, uh, within plastics manufacture and looking at the design of single use plastics. So the specific focus as well is to, to look at, at opportunities to, um, to tackle the pervasive problem with single use plastics. Looking at um, um, information that has surfaced from the Ocean Conservancy, the 10 most frequently found plastics in ocean cleanups tend to be single use items from fast moving consumer goods, um, single use packaging primarily. And within that you get the soft film structures, uh, plastic packets, wraps, bags, um, and then the more rigid and durable plastics such as plastic bottles, caps, tub trays, beverage containers, um, straw serviceware. So that's definitely a focus area. We'd, we'd want to look at solutions that can uh, provide alternatives in that category. And then also the health segment. Um, and here we consider PPE equipment, um, hygiene products and, and film-based packaging. So that's very broadly speaking where the, where the program aims to, to intervene. The geographical scope of the, pro of the project, um, and I think the text here is quite small, but essentially um, SMEP focuses on interventions in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and we've listed our target countries here, DRC, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Rwanda, Senegal, Uganda, um, Republic of Tanzania, Zambia, and South Asia, just Bangladesh, um, Nepal, and Pakistan. So we're open to um, concepts that sort have of application more broadly in these areas, but they need to be um, well motivated to have a high impact. Um, and we're also open to concepts that don't necessarily don't necessarily originate in these areas, but they should have strong application within these areas. And any piloting activities would need to take place within these folk within these target areas. I'm going to ask Terry McCormack to speak to these, um, these slides, with, which give more detail on the nature of the types of solutions that we're looking for. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Um, basically, the solutions that we are interested in are falling into these three broad categories. Um, as Amanda has said, we know that there are several single use items which are problem a problem, uh, they are challenging, and we're looking to replace them uh, where we can. So we're looking to replace um, difficult or challenging plastics with uh, alternative materials, uh, with better designs, uh, possibly uh, biodegradable solutions. And we're looking at overall improving the recyclability of single use, uh, single use items. The second category that we have here is around biodegradation biodegradation and um, basically here we're looking for what is a waste management solution which could entail using microbiological activity to degrade plastics waste. The third category that we are looking at is in the manufacturing area. Um, for example, we know that um, plastic productions operations do uh, involve loss of material. And here we see that um, there should be better control and housekeeping, but we also need novel devices, I think, to, uh, to intercede to, uh, to, uh, as interceptor devices here. Um, and lastly, remanufacturing. Here we're looking at um, repurposing plastic articles at the end of their lifetime. 
And finally, we do have um, interest because this is an overall a manufacturing, um, let's say, program. We are interested in industrial symbiosis approaches, which reduce waste and improve uh, resource efficiency. And some solutions may cut across the entire uh, entire board here. Uh, we wanted to make a note really on biodegradability that we are aware that um, this is not a panacea and solutions should be very well, uh, well thought through. Um, a couple of words about the procurement process that we aim to, to run. Um, firstly, we are at this point uncertain of the, um, of the actual launch date. So the intention with, um, with this webinar um, and with the material that we've circulated thus far is really pre-market engagement. It's to ensure that the message gets out and that we get as many interested and, uh, and good quality applicants um, registered and, and ready to respond to the opportunity um, once we launch the call. So once we open the call, um, interested applicants will register online and we've already invited participants to do so. It's um, basically a, a questionnaire which we've, which we've got, um, which remains open on the SMEP, the SMEP website. Once we launch, we circulate the terms of reference um, and the terms of reference will provide detailed guidance on the criteria for the funding concepts. Terry will touch on those um, in a little bit more detail. Um, but essentially, we're looking for an overview of the concept, very, very high level, um, information on how it meets the program criteria. The funding requirement, and this is quite important um, for the selection process because we need to, we've got, uh, we've We've got several bands of funding available, um, which we'll speak about in um, uh, further down in the presentation. But we'll need to we, we need to um, collect a, um, a portfolio of different of different projects, both within the high level of funding and a, um, and starting at the bottom rung, which is we're looking at entry entry budgets of two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. So the, the potential impact, um, and we'd like to have some reflection there on the life cycle assessments, um, and then very high level due diligence. So there'll be a process um, of selection and um, a, a restricted um, request for proposals. And here we'll go, be going into a lot more detail in terms of the, um, the structuring of the, of the, the, the delivery of the, of the work um, and the budget um, development. So all of these um, submissions, both the call for concept submissions um, and the restricted um, request for proposals will be via the online uh, procurement portal, which we have on the SMEP website. Some information on the selection process that we'll be running once we launch. Um, so the call will be open for a six week period. We'll have a four week period to evaluate concepts. Um, and then the request for proposals, so that will be open for six weeks in total, definitely no shorter than six weeks. The evaluation process, um, and here we'll definitely, we'll be calling on um, the SMEP um, independent panel of um, independent experts, announcing um, the contracts. And then we've, you'll see here we've scheduled uh, between two to eight weeks um, for the contracting, and um, that is because we anticipate that the contracting in this particular area may be complex. There may well be commercial and IP considerations that will need um, a, a careful negotiation within the contracting time. So we anticipate essentially from um, the point where we um, where we launch the the formal call that it should take um, between between five to six months to actually begin um, and get going, get going with the work. I'm going to ask Terry to, um, to speak to the next slide on the considerations for developing concepts. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, basically, um, we have to think about the territories and the countries of interest that we have here, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And therefore in, you know, putting forward concepts, we think you need to consider things such as the affordability of the solution, uh, accessibility to natural resources, 
transport infrastructure, the status of current waste management systems. Um, but there are some other uh, contextual considerations, uh, such as the potential for local sourcing, employment opportunities, and how do you engage with the, the local value chains or so the existing value chains? Uh, what are the, you know which stakeholders uh, do you need to reach out to? There will also be perhaps some IP, so intellectual property considerations that we need to think about, and these will form part of the terms of reference uh, when the actual call uh, is constructed. Uh, and, and of course, the whole ethos, if you will, of SMEP is around sustainability. So what are the sustainability uh, impacts and what are the life cycle uh, implications? Next slide, please. In, in terms of how we will be rating um, these particular concepts as they come through, uh, essentially, there will, will be these four categories. So first of all, governance, and uh, we will talk a little bit more about due diligence in a moment. Um, but also primarily the technical quality of the concept. Um, at which status is it? Uh, so technology readiness. Um, we're probably looking at things from technology readiness level five, so piloting and above, ideally. Although, uh, if there are concepts which, you know, with a little bit of funding can accelerate through the, you know, technical readiness levels, then they would be of interest. Then we're looking at how does this particular solution impact on the overall objective? You know, is it reducing pollution? Uh, what impacts does it consequently have on sustainability uh, in these particular areas that, uh, that you see cited here? And then the effectiveness of the delivery. So what sort of business model can you, can you propose? Have you considered the commercial and investment requirements, obviously, uh, perhaps some of the policy requirements, some of the regulatory requirements and so forth. So the next slide, please. Um, this is just to, to reiterate a little bit about what I said earlier. Um, what is really in scope, uh, particularly interested in new and emergent uh, raw materials technologies, uh, innovative product design, which will help to um, design out the, the failure of uh, challenged items, which are often dispersed uh, within the environment. We're looking for those inventions which help raw materials escaping from production processes or distribution. And promising concepts, as I say, which can um, you know, with, with some funding and with some additional support can progress rapidly through the readiness levels and overcome perhaps regulatory bar barriers which are holding them back. It's worth saying what is not primarily in scope, uh, and I think Jez mentioned that earlier, um, we're not looking at traditional waste management solutions here because this program is meant to be complementary. Although we understand that um, the end of life fate of whatever you know, whatever proposed uh, materials or proposed uh, systems uh, is also of, uh, of big, big importance uh, in, in the overall life cycle uh, consideration. Uh, and remanufacturing solutions, of course, by implication <clears throat> would mean that they've been through a perhaps prior life. Therefore, there is a, a waste management requirement there as well. Uh, and just to reiterate, I think Jess said, well, you know, obviously projects which are currently running in the advanced economy uh, scenario, if they can be translated into um, the, uh, the target territories and countries, then uh, they would be of interest, but we're not looking for things which are limited in focus or limited in potential. Thank you. <clears throat> oh. Thanks, Amanda. So this is just broadly looking at the funding uh, scope. We have up to five million pounds to spend over a 36 month period. Uh, and those are to be awarded in three bands, the high, medium and low. Uh, and we're looking at six to eight projects uh, in those bands. So eight projects maximum in three potential bands. It's very important, I think, for applicants to consider where 
they can best meet both their institutional capacity uh, and also where their spend profile is within the overall project period. So this is something to consider and, and to reflect on uh, when we launch the terms of reference and, and you make your applications. Um, it's important to, to note, and this is something with all FCDO resources at the moment, is we will get budget commitments on a year-to-year -year basis. So we need to think in terms of contracting, we will do annual contracts, which will be renewable. So you'll provide a, a, a budget across a two or potentially three year period. Um, and you need to think about discrete pieces of work that you will do within each financial year. The financial year, of course, may start uh, in the middle of, or your project may start in the middle of the financial year. And when you think about sequencing your deliverables and outputs based upon a schedule. So that allows you to kind of say, well, we want to experiment with this thing. If this happens, we would like then to proceed with the following implementation and these are our budgets. And we can then work on, an, on a year-to-year -year basis with uh, fine tuning and detailing what those budgets will be based upon the delivery of initial work. Um, of course, that requires or assumes that there's going to be some ongoing review of project implementation. And I guess the bottom line is here that you're not going to be awarded, a, say, a one million pound project for 36 months and be told, you know, OK, let us know what happens in 36 months time. You're going to be engaging with the team, with the ITAP. We're going to be uh, reflecting on, on, on where we need to tweak. Uh, so that might seem as a, a, a disadvantage, but I'm hoping that it also assumes, and this is an asset to you and your project, that there's an, a flexibility built into that, that as we move and as your project progresses, we can respond to the needs of the project as it becomes clear what those needs are and whether success is imminent or not. It also, of course, assumes that uh, if the first phase of a project illustrates that the concept is not feasible uh, or commercially affordable in the longer term, uh, the project can be stopped at any time or at, in, in relation to those deliverables. Um, we'll actually provide some details to you on what we think are going to be the timeframes and the budgets per year uh, when we launch the terms of reference. You'll understand that we these are fairly sizable contracts and we just want to run through basically ensuring that if you're applying for this, you need to ascertain that the entity that is your main applicant uh, complies with broadly these six criteria. Um, those of you that have been through FCDO due diligence process will know that there's a great deal of complexity within each of these criteria, but broadly speaking, this needs to be a registered entity, a tax regist registered entity, it needs to be compliant with its local uh, legal uh, responsibilities in whichever jurisdiction it, it trades. Um, and when you submit your registration of interest, you'll self-certify that you do. And when we receive your concept, we will verify that that's the case. And that verification is relatively light touch, but it would be a waste of your and our time uh, if when we get to the point of uh, proposal, we realize that, that your uh, self-certification -cert was erroneous and that you don't, for example, have a tax registration certificate. So this is an opportunity to think about the vehicle that you would like to use for this process. Uh, financial stability, uh, apart from audited financials and tax compliance and the internal controls and some income diversity, you could take it as assume that if you're applying for more than the average of your annual turnover for the last three years, then 
we're going to apply additional due diligence. If you're applying for the same, if you're not increasing your turnover by more than 100%, we will provide less due diligence requirements. So this is a, an opportunity to consider the entity and whether in fact your sweet spot is in category one or category three of the um, maximum budget. I'm not going to go through each of these uh, elements. Those of you familiar with, with projects of this nature will understand what they mean. Um, I just want to point out that under item four, yes, you can form consortia, you can subcontract partners. Of course, that assumes that you've got the capacity and the experience and the history in managing your subcontractors. Uh, there'll be some checking of your ability to deliver via performance and references and checks on your uh, compliance. Uh, safeguarding is an FCDO requirement and this relates to the, your duty of care and that duty of care needs to be managed through to your subcontractors. So there's lots and lots of detail behind that, of course, but this is just a flavor of where we want you to be thinking prior to uh, submitting a concept and making sure that you get your house in order and your consortia in order and think about who will lead and who will be subcontractors and whether you would more or less fall within the uh, due diligence compliance. Thanks, Jeremy, back to you. Great, thank you very much, um, uh, Carl and Amanda and um, uh, Terry, that's been uh, very helpful. So now we get to the question and answer stage. I see that people have already begun asking some questions. So I think um, coming up with the first one I've got in front of me is from Eben de Jong um, and asking about due diligence, Carl. So uh, the point about a clean audit for three years, how, do, how does it affect businesses that are younger than three years? Um, Carl, can I ask you to, to address that comment? That question, please. Yeah. So, so listen, we, we would, you know, it might be that there was you know, a very good reason why a business is recently incorporated or a nonprofit or research institution. Uh, it could be, for example, given that you're at the University of X and that you've just established a research unit which is set up as its own independent legal entity, but that your capacity has run for the last three or four years. Um, or even longer, maybe decades, as a department of the university. So these rules are there not as hard and fast, but to ensure compliance. So if you can persuade us that, listen, we've only registered a year ago, but we have all the capacity of management and compliance and duty of care and tax under control, these are our resources. We're overseen by a board of governors and we have an income uh, that justifies our request for uh, the, the level of funding that we've applied for, I guess we could be persuaded. The opposite of that is that clearly if you've incorporated an entity which is a shell and is incorporated for the purposes of this application and has no history or track record and no substance behind it, well, then you're wasting your time. So I would imagine that this is a question that we can engage on even before you submit your um, concept. If you would like to talk us through your institution and uh, uh, its particular history, we can give you an indication of whether that would be considered compliant. And if not, well, then you can gear up and maybe submit in my example through the university. Uh, rather than through your newly formed institution. Great, thanks very much, Carl. Uh, moving on, I, I see we've got four questions from Daniel. Uh, the first um, set of questions is around categories. And this is the issue around, I don't know, how far are we uh, going to be only interested in, um, uh, in new technologies and research that intervenes in the manufacturing process and how far can we expand it to be able to embrace um, some of the end of life and recycling. Um, I think I will hand over to Terry um, to give you a sort of a more 
uh, um, definitive answer. But from my point of view, the reason we are doing this two stage process, where we're encouraging people to put their their concepts in first is we want people to we want to see all these ideas. Um, we, do, we want to do it in a way that doesn't take an, an onerous amount of time for you to put these proposals in. So if you are unsure about something, uh, I would encourage you to contact us, just like Carl has said, or that you do actually put in this concept note, uh, and then we can engage with you on it. So in terms of the recycling, um, our preference is to engage in the manufacturing process. However, and this actually points to your partnerships uh, question, Daniel, at the end, we are, I mean, you know, we are interested in remanufacturing and reprocessing, and that's going to need a, um, a supply. So if you're um, part of a partnership where your recycling is helping to provide um, a material for a new technology that's providing a new type of plastic, then we would definitely be interested in that bigger sort of um, uh, partnership and we as also as SMET we're, we're happy to play as some sort of brokering service as well you know if if you're looking for particular um, uh, um, research or or ideas to help complement what you're doing you can uh, contact us and you know through our network we can maybe start doing some sort of brokering around this sort of thing so I think um, we know we're definitely very focused on the manufacturing process but um, it does that does not mean that um, we would not look at something that had at least in part some sort of intervention in the waste stream and recycling. Um, Terry, can I ask you to maybe put a bit more detail to that? Yes, I, 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 uh, I can. But basically, um, I think I said earlier, uh, one of the areas that we're interested in is um, industrial symbiosis. So um, if this is a way of improving you know, the manufacturing process, reducing waste overall, then it is of interest um, uh, because then it is actually an upstream um, operation uh, rather than, you know, just a recycling operation. However, um, there, are, there are some opportunities for recycling in general that, you know, so downstream operations um, coming out of waste management where you are definitely stopping, let's say, um, how it challenged articles going into landfill and then consequently potentially leaking out and getting into the environment. So there are some, some opportunities and interest in uh, solid proposals there. Uh, but basically what we're saying is that we're not focused just on, on waste management. For example, if uh, there is you know, another pyrolysis system that is being proposed, uh, then um, there are plenty of people operating in that space already. And we try to be complementary here. We're trying to look for something a little bit more novel. So uh, it's probably worth exchanging, um, uh, you know, ideas to understand a little bit better where you're coming from there, Daniel, but um, it's areas that you touch on there that I can see from your question could potentially be in scope. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, so um, looking at the financials, I see Amanda's made a comment. Um, I mean, theoretically, yes. I mean, I think one of the important things to get across here is that we are trying, to, we are interested in um, making significant uh, progress during these the, the SMET period. So we're, we're more interested in um, new technologies that are already proven in the lab, what um, sometimes people call technology readiness level six to nine. There is some flexibility around that. So, um, and if there is some capital expenditure that's required on that, then obviously we would consider it. Uh, on the expectations on co-funding, it is not a hard and fast requirement. Clearly, if you've got co-funding, that is great. And, and that would be um, very, uh, you know, that would be welcome. Um, okay, next question. Um, will we consider geographical representativeness in um, the evaluation? Um, Amanda, I might hand that on to you. Could you um, maybe perhaps answer that? Thanks, Jez. Um, I wasn't, um, I wanted to touch on, there was a, a question on the previous one about project links. Are they expected to, are they expected to run for 36 months? And the answer is no, um, they need not run for 36 months. That's the maximum duration. The geographic representation, I wasn't entirely sure what was meant there, whether it was about a concept that has 
a wide geographic reach or whether we would be looking um, to work with um, applicants who have got um, representatives within the target countries. I think the, um, the, the, latter, the latter part, yes, most definitely, if there are representatives or partners within the target countries, particularly if, if you're aiming to, to construct um, a pilot delivery within the, the target countries, that would be advantageous. If it's the former, um, the question about a widespread reach, I think it's, it's a combination of, um, of criteria that we would look at, at for impact. Um, and geography would just be would just be one of those. So if there's a potential solution that has got um, there's a there's a high potential for geographic uptake once it's been piloted, most most certainly it would come into consideration. Um, that's thank you. That's great. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think we have some flexibility on the geographic. Again, we would like to see your concept. Um, you know, we ultimately, as I think it was Carl and Amanda probably said that we, you know, we this has to have application in these target countries. But, you know, if a, you know another country such as Brazil or Malaysia was involved, um, we certainly would be interested. Um, I think then moving on, um, there is a question around um, um, direct venture building, uh, rather than a research project, an actionable implementation of a validated solution. Um, I th this is a very good question. I mean, we we when I mentioned this TRL level is TRL level nine. It is it is a proven concept, it's ready to be rolled out. So, if there's something about operating in a different geography, in making it more lean and making it more efficient, so it can operate in that in that context, and I think we are interested. Um, please do feel, Adam, do feel free to uh, engage us a bit more detail on that. Um, it is research, so. Uh, you know, we, we are interested that that has to be a research element to it. But I think there is some flexibility on that, you know, so it could be a, a, an application in a different geography. Um, the due diligence point two. Uh, um, OK, we've answered that um, um, geographically. We've answered that. Um, could there be more than one concept from the same company? Yes, I, I think we could. Um, we have there's no restriction on how many concepts you want to put across. If you've got the capacity to do such a thing, then great. Uh, you know, we, we we'd be interested in in looking at more than one concept. Um, okay, then we are working intensively on um, circular economy solutions. Um, we should should we focus on category two accelerated bio degradation in circular economy solutions included in this component do you have a separate one for circular economy so good question i, I mean um we uh, circular economy is a cross-cutting issue so it certainly it, it certainly helps uh, uh it's a certainly part of our this particular circ, um plastics call so um you know if you have a circular economy solution and it, it will help in plastics then please do submit then we are going to have other calls and there will probably be a call on circular economy specifically. There may be <clears> calls um, on, on industrial pollution, which involves circular economy as well. So um, accelerated biodegradation is definitely an area we're interested in. Um, so, yes, I would encourage you to, to submit. Um, when do you expect the call for proposal to start? Also, is co-funding a precondition? OK, so... Um, Co-funding co is not a precondition. Um, we would expect this to start. Amanda, can I hand over to you to um, maybe talk a little bit about timescales? Um, I think the question, the question is specifically about the call for proposals and when we expect this to start. So I mentioned at the start of the presentation that we are, we're essentially well prepared um, to launch but we are awaiting um, final clarity from FCDO on um, on budget, so we certainly wouldn't launch any time within the next two weeks, um, and and after that, it's it's really up to FCDO. Great, thank you, um, Terry. I I answered the question previously. Um, was there anything you wanted to add to that question that I that I answered? Y yes, I would. <clears throat> You're right. Um, circular economy, in effect, permeates across <clears throat> all of the different categories that we are interested in inviting solutions from. Uh, if you look at category one, for example, we talk about improving the recyclability of single-use items. So things which would normally be 
have to be disposed of or discarded, um, improving um, you know, the, the, their circularity basically is what we're talking about there. Uh, and also repurposing as a manu in, in the remanufacturing, this is uh, again, uh, a circular uh, approach. So yes, I think um, we have elements of, uh, of circular economy, which, uh, which are cross-cutting as, yeah, as you say. Great, okay. So then on to, is the DRC eligible within Sub-Saharan Africa? Yes, definitely. Um, no, uh, NGOs can also um, apply, uh, companies or NGOs can apply. So, um, and, and also partnerships between them can also. Um, would you consider digital technologies, are, are AI assisted intelligence um, platforms to redirect waste streams in industrial symbiosis? Um, on this particular call, it would have to have a focus on plastics, but yes, we are potentially interested in that. Uh, Terry, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, not really. I, I think you're right. I mean, this particular call is around an intervention on plastics pollution. So um, wherever, um, you know, symbiosis approaches can be brought to bear, which have an impact on that, then yes, they're, they're, they're in scope. Uh, I think the basic original, um, if you like, the umbrella SMET um, program would be interested in, 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 in more broader uh, symbiosis opportunities. Great. Um, how do we get in touch if you want to engage us um, in more detail? There is our, our website, the, S, the SMET website. Um, we can also, when we circulate the notes from this meeting, we can put in some contact details for some key people for you to, to engage with, um, Daniel. Um, there's still Adam's um, original question up at the top, um, which I think we I tried to answer. Um, you know, we are definitely... Um, interested in um uh, in new ventures um in in um different ge geographies in using technologies that are already proven you know there is potential for that so that would potentially be in scope i mean there was a question that also related to that in terms of partnerships so uh, some of our you know, log frame deliverables relate to the uptake and implementation. So, you know, our, our log frame looks in the medium to long term to change the world. And that assumes a level of practical application. So if you're a university and you're submitting a concept, it would boost your application to have a private sector partner that would like and is interested in running with your concept. Um, and maybe your concept would be boosted further if that private sector partner has put up the capital to pilot the, pro uh, the, the concept. So the partnership, if you're a, a private sector institution and you want to uh, you know, introduce a new manufacturing process or new technology within your packaging uh, process, then probably a good idea that you've got the right kind of research partners on board that can monitor and engage and support your uh, process of learning and piloting. So yes, the, the partnerships are not essential that you can apply as a single applicant, but given the nature of where we're trying to get to, we are likely or we assume that we're going to receive applications from organizations in partnership that bring different skills to bear on the problem. Um, and then that introduces the question of whether there's capital expenditure possibly. And yes, in relation to piloting a particular technology, uh, SMET may fund the initial costs of piloting, which could be of a capital nature. Although that's not the primary purpose to fund the rollout. The rollout will come later and probably cost a lot more than SMEP has budget for. I hope that clarifies some of those questions. Great. Um, um, I noticed um, Amanda invited you, Terry, to uh, perhaps add some more details to a previous question. Is, is there something you would like to add to that? Uh, just on the TRL, um, we haven't been <clears throat> Particularly precise, uh, uh, you've said, chairs, uh, you know, six and above. So there you're looking at large scale right away through to operations. Um, but I think um, pilot scale may may come into into view. 
uh, particularly in the context of doing a pilot in in one of the um, you know target territories, for example, that would be of great interest because that's from there you know the whole uh, process can can start afresh. Uh, so when we're you know we're thinking about organizations who already have gone through some of these perhaps pilot scales, there may be obviously in the um, established economies, uh, and we're interested in solutions for the uh, emerging economies, therefore uh, piloting and bringing those partners together to, to, to do that would be of, uh, of great interest. So that's why I mean, you know, five, six pilot scale, large scale, um, it really just depends on the nature of the, uh, of the concept. And as, we, uh, as we've seen the questions here around engaging with researchers, uh, they may still be further upstream for that uh, bench scale, for example, having developed a proof of concept. Uh, so nothing's ruled out in the sense that if they, with a limited amount of money, because uh, as Carlos said, that you know, there, there is a finite budget here and a time scale attached to this. Um, if with a limited amount of money, they can move through the, you know, towards a pilot scale uh, and, uh, and beyond type of level, then why not? Uh, you know, th they could be of interest. Uh, but ultimately the objective, um, reducing the level of, uh, of plastics pollution that we have in the target geographies, which we've spoken to. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so a quick question from Peter. Um, so uh, there are already recent startups which are, you know, require um, support to accelerate and scale up what, what their, their prototype. I think definitely we're interested in that. Um, we, um, as, as Terry just mentioned, um, I think we're flexible about, um, you know, so you no, know, originally we started off being, uh, talking about being six to nine, but I think we're flexible, um, you know, in earlier TRL levels and, and also at, uh, right up to nine, which is about scaling up. Uh, because you know, we if we if we think a solution has promise that it can it will because one of the things we will try and do is once we have proven the concept we've invested in a particular technology and it works we will also help um, we will also seek to help prepare business plans and seek further on um, 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 uh, in, um, uh, investment sources for those successful projects and that's in part of our mandate. So we'll definitely be interested um, in, in, in projects that we think can take go all the way. So we, there is some flexibility in that. Um, so another question from Daniel, I think here. Um, so I think, yes, yeah, so Peter, hopefully that answers your question. Um, um, okay, with the program's view on biodegradable materials causing issues of waste management recycling. Um, Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think there are some challenges here. Um, I think I will ask um, Terry to perhaps um, comment on this. It's a very good point, um, and it is one we have discussed. Yes. In, in fact, in fact, um, we do have a kind of health warning when it comes to um, you know biodegradability being a function of, of a material, uh, and it's certainly not a panacea, as I touched on earlier. Um, yes, we we're aware that existing waste management. Um, systems, particularly those involved with uh, mechanical recycling, uh, can be impeded by um, materials in there which are designed to biodegrade and can create some, some issues. So what we've said is um, that wherever there is a proposal for a biodegradable material to be used, it's obviously being used in a context. So it will be for a particular uh, material, uh, a particular item or article or system. Um, and it is very important to consider the ramifications downstream uh, of, of deploying that. So is it compatible with existing systems? Can it have its own, its own closed loop? Uh, what are the waste management um, uh, options available, uh, particularly in the target territories that, we, that we're referring to? So we expect that that would be fully considered uh, under the life cycle um, let's say considerations for a, a given system. Now we're not asking people to do an LCA, particularly not at the concept stage, but we're asking them to have an idea of the potential impacts, um, both through manufacturing, sourcing, manufacturing uh, and, and use phase, and then the end of life um, system that would need to be brought to bear. So we expect that people who have a concept in mind 
have given due consideration to those aspects. Um, so are there any more questions? Uh, it looks like we've answered 21 questions so far. I mean, what we're really hoping is that people are going to be putting their concepts together. Uh, we're very happy to engage with you further um, on any ideas or any questions you have. Um, you know, we, we really are encouraging people to, um, uh, to talk to one another. I, I noticed somebody talked about a, collabor a collaborative platform and things like that. We will we'll look into that and how we can foster that sort of collaboration. I also noticed that lots of people are putting in their, their details, their contact details now, which is, I think is great. Um, encourage people to do that. Um, and um, I'd like to just open up to the panel once more, see if there are any final thoughts or comments from Amanda or Carl um, or Terry on this. Jez, I noted the question um, regarding um, uh, making contact details for the registrants um, available publicly so that um, people can reach out and collaborate. Um, and I think we'll find a, think of a way to put that question to registrants to find out if they're happy that we share their details. I would just say, yes, the idea of having a frequently asked question. So we do have a draft um, version of that, um, which would need to be polished up and uh, certainly take into account some of the good questions that we've had today as well. Um, and in terms of um, engaging further than, yes, encouraging people and if they have any you know, questions that they wish to clarify relating to their potential project and to, um, to reach out. Great. Um, is there, are there any more ad, um, administration points that we need to um, um, highlight, do you think, Amanda? No, I'm just, um, Terry's right. I do, we do have a draft FAQ. We'll update it. There have been some good questions asked and we'll aim to share that early next week at the latest um, and make that, we'll make that available as well on our, um, our SMEP website, but all registrants will be alerted to that. Great. Well, thank you very much everybody for joining today. Um, we look forward to receiving concept notes for everybody once we open everything up. Uh, we hope to be able to do that imminently and we will be in touch. Thank you very much, everybody.